Uh, well, thanks for having all of us back. And this is actually the first panel that we're doing for this class. So I think it's going to be really interesting. It's actually quite a rare treat to get all of these different perspectives into one room, given that usually when you um, have a conversation, it would usually just be from the founder's perspective or from the investor's perspective um, or from the corporate perspective. But today we have all three of them together. So I think it's going to make for a really interesting conversation. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, I know all three of you came in from heavy traffic from far, far away, all the way down in South Bay. So I'm um, excited to hear more from you. Um, I know that you guys have all read um, about the bios that were sent out, um, so I want uh, all of you to tell us, uh, well, the whole class, a little bit more about your background beyond the bios. You know, tell us a bit more about your background, your journey, and how you got here. Sure, you so we can go either way. Uh, hi everyone, I'm uh, Ashini or Ash. Um, I am. Uh, it won't go too far into my history, but I'm, a, I'm an East Coast native. I grew up in Boston. Um, I'm a mom of two kids, two and five. Um, I currently work at Google as a corporate development team. Uh, prior to this, I was an investment banker. Um, prior to that, I was in business school during our 2009 uh, collapse of the market. Uh, and then prior to that, I was a consultant in both strategy consulting and code development and implementing large systems. Um, at Alphabet now, I spend a lot of my time um, on uh, half of my time on the Alphabet side and half on the Google side and the corporate development team, which means we do acquisitions, investments, uh, divestitures, um, spin outs, uh, creating CVs, and creating the new Alphabet companies that are going to support development. Um, and, and so I spend some of my time thinking about the alphabet stuff um, and then the other time on the Google side thinking about machine learning, um, our AI teams, and immersive computing. Uh, my name is Moyes. Uh, I'm also an East Coast native. Um, I was an attorney during the 2009 collapse. <laughs> Uh, I started an e-commerce business back in New York uh, in 2000, a well, lot stopping being a lawyer, and started an e-commerce business in 2012 in New York, um, sold into a small family office, um, and then started a direct-to-consumer deal-room business uh, in San Francisco in 2015. Um, Way was actually our first investor, uh, and then we sold the business to Procter & Gamble in, um, in 2017. Uh, and uh, I run the business under the PNG umbrella today as an independent subsidiary. Okay. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Wei. Um, I was raised a month uh, in China. I went to Singapore for high school. Uh, came here 2008. Uh, I was in uh, USF. Uh, probably some of you are familiar with that school in downtown. So my major was entrepreneurship. I learned VC when I was in banking. Uh, uh, USF, and then uh, so entrepreneurship was a uh, uh, so my major was entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship was a great major. I learned a lot of business skills, but uh, it, it's there's some problem with entrepreneurship uh, major. It's when you graduate, you are not able to find a job. So I was you either have to start your own business or uh, or uh, join some VC firm. Uh, as an international student, it's really hard to find a way to join a music firm or even get a regular job. So, so I didn't have any chance to start. You know, I started my own business. I started, uh, I started my own VC firm by using my own money. And then uh, it was you know, a good time. I, I quickly raised some money from some institutional investor from China. And uh, right now, we uh, we're just a cross-border VC firm backed by a lot of uh, Chinese internet tech firms such as Alibaba, Tencent, Tiger Tokyo, and uh, many top tier Chinese VCs like Dolan Capital, Matrix China, IDG, and we have like around 40, 50 uh, LPs. Um, we have already invested 300 companies, including seven unicorn companies and 40, 50 companies with more than 100 million dollars valuation. And that's okay. 
Awesome. So uh, I know the theme of today is really to talk about uh, startup financing. And so uh, you really get this diversity of opinion across the panel where um, you get to hear what uh, that process is like from a VC's perspective, from a founder's perspective, and also from a corporate perspective. So um, before we get further, I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about your experience or one of the latest deals that you've worked on. Obviously, it's different for Lois, given that you have to talk about your own company. Um, whereas maybe for Wei and for Ash, uh, it's more from a kind of deal perspective. Maybe walk us through a little bit about how that process worked um, to give folks a little bit more insight into behind the scenes what it's like. Sure, I'm happy we'll to start. start with you. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, I'll say I'm probably the worst person who's ever raised money ever. Uh, I'm really bad at it. Um, uh, we were like uh, we like native raised five hundred thousand dollars of the course of the life of the business. Um, we launched in July twenty fifteen. We wrote our first fifty k check in November twenty fifteen, so three or four months after we launched, um, and then we raised another two hundred fifty k in April or May of twenty sixteen. And that was really all the fundraising we did over the, like we raised twenty five k in Iran from you know uh, some angel investors we thought might add strategic value over the business. Um, but nothing serious, and we didn't do uh, what's typically done in Silicon Valley, which is you know you get all of your investors lined up, have a bunch of meetings over the course of two weeks, start from the least interested investor, or like the least uh, the worst fit strategically to the best fit strategically, and run that type of process. We did run that type of process when we were selling the business, but not when we were fundraising. Um, actually, what happened is I, I was randomly at a party uh, of a friend of mine in 2015, uh, this guy named Mark Seeger. He introduced me to Way and the other guy that we raised money from, um, and so realistically, we never got a no. Like uh, as soon as we launched, we only pitched to two people, and we never got a no. Uh, yeah, Way. Not only was Way the first one. He like when he was giving his bio, I, I told everyone this before, and um, he didn't tell them the most fun part, which was uh, when we were selling the business. I texted him and I was like, "Hey, I have to chat with you," um, and he, he texted me back and he's like, "Is it urgent?" I said, "Yeah, it is." Um, I'm going to have to have you sign a bunch of docs and like, tell you what's going on. So he said, hey, we turned your 50K into a million dollars. Um, and I, need you, I called him up. I said, we turned your 50K into a million dollars. We need you to sign a bunch of docs. And he's like, um, my wife is giving birth today, but this is the best news I've heard all day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'll never forget when you said that. <laughs> uh, Don't tell his wife. I tell everybody that except his wife. Um, <laughs> Um, but in any case, yeah, so we raised um, 300, well actually we raised all $550,000 through YC Safe documents. Um, we priced the rounds uh, at every stage and those prices sort of went up. Um, and, and so for us it was like, um, sl like you know, aside from way, the next guys that we pitched to was a VC fund in San Francisco called Azure Capital. We, we actually did get a, hey, not right now from them early on. And basically what happened is I just went home and kept building a business. Um, every month, our revenue started. In, our, our, our revenue was going up 20, 30 percent, and so I would just email them with our, our new revenue numbers, and I'd say, "Hey, um, you said no in December when we were at 20k. Now we're at 35k. It's January. Um, you know, a, you know, February we're at 80k. Uh, April we're at 120k. Um, and at some point, they're like, okay, why don't you come back in for another meeting?' Um, and then I ended up writing a check. So for us, it was an atypical experience, um, but it was also a really fascinating. Experience. So uh, to draw out a couple of pieces that you mentioned for students who are not as familiar with the process. So number one, you mentioned that you ended up using all YC safe documents. So obviously you're not a YC company, but you ended up using standard documents. So explain a little bit more how that process works. Sure. Um, so when you're, raising do when you're raising money, you can do multiple types of um, documents. I used to be an attorney, and so it made it a little bit easier. Um, one is a convertible note. Another is like a standard equity agreement. <laughs> Standard, uh, uh, and three, uh, the third option is a YC safe document, which stands for, uh, I have no idea anymore actually. <laughs> but really it's like a two page document. Um, it's really easy. The best part about it is you can download it from the internet. There's virtually no legal fees because it's a two page document, so you don't have to go to an attorney. Um, and, and then and like the only terms you negotiate are one, do you price your company, meaning do you say, hey, this is what we think, we both agree the company is worth today, or do you say, hey, there's a discount to the company, so let's say we're raising money today, um, and we don't, we can't agree to a price. I'm not sure if the company's worth five million today or 10 million today, and to be honest, really nobody knows. 
Um, so what we say is, look, we, we can't figure out the price today, but you know, whenever we raise money later on, I'll give you a discount to whatever we raise money at. So later on, let's say our company is worth a hundred million dollars, I'll, I'll have your equity um, convert at an eighty million, or I'll have your investment convert at an eighty million dollar valuation, a twenty percent discount to what we're raising later on, um, because we can't agree to a price today. For us, we set prices um, early on because they were small chunks of money, so they weren't going to dramatically move the needle. Um, but you know, those are the two two different ways to like raise money: you can either price the round, or you can um, set a discount to your next valuation. So that's actually perfect because your experience is very different than the traditional you know pitch a lot of investors. But what you can really draw from that experience is that build a real business, and then opportunities naturally come, right? If you have strong revenue, that's better indication than anything else. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, in fact, like after we had raised um, you know, that three hundred thousand dollars, we sort of never went into the market again to raise money. And I can't tell you the number of investors who started contacting us, and I have no idea how they heard of us. Like, you know, we we had a team of eight people when we sold the business. Generally, three or four while we were growing the business, and so we were pretty small. Uh, we were never in the press. We never announced our fundraising in TechCrunch. We never announced revenue numbers or profit numbers. I have no idea how they found us, but if you build a strong business, investors will find you. It's their full-time job. Mm -hmm. um, and the last piece I wanted to add there is that um, I actually love the fact that um, we're sharing your story, particularly in this context, because just because we're talking about fundraising doesn't mean you need to raise millions and millions of dollars in order to be a successful company. Um, it also doesn't mean that you need to do plenty of marketing and PR in order to be a great company. So you can actually do neither of the two and just build a strong business and focus on the core, which I think is the most important part. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we raised um, $500,000. When we sold the business, we were generating a million in net profit a month. We were we had $12 million in cash in our balance sheet. Like. Uh, we had generated, we had created a really great business that was minting money, um, and, and like in, aside from the fact that investors realized that, so did um, you know acquirers. And, and like, whenever e-commerce businesses raise money, I'm always like, uh, this is a double-edged sword. Like, you know, investors are going to want to see three to ten x every dollar they give you. Um, and, and so, if you're going to if you're going to raise money as a step of valuation. You're gonna to have to work here for another 18 months for an acquirer to realize that valuation as well, um, and so so it's a long slog. I'll tell you one of the other stories. When we we pitched a one uh, one point to four runner ventures, which is like a, a notable venture capital fund in direct to consumer businesses, and they said, um, look, we could raise 30 million dollars and uh, and give away 20 percent of our business, or we could raise three million dollars and give away 20 percent of our business. If we raised thirty million dollars, we'd have to uh, like the beat, like they were very, very frank with us. So like you're gonna have to work here for another five years to justify this valuation and find an exit. If you raise three million dollars and give away twenty percent of your business, you can work here for three more months and find an exit. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't take any of their money, but like that's that's really how it went. And like they were honest and they were right about that as well. Absolutely. Um, and with that, I'd love to move to Wei as well, given that you're the first investor in Native. Do tell us a little bit more about how that process works from your perspective. For investing or for For investing. investing. Um, uh, this year or like in general? You can talk about native or in general. Either. I think I'll start with general first. Yeah. Uh, so I think I just the early student investor. The couple of things I'm looking for number one is the, the founder, uh, like the background of the founder, the experience of the founder, and then the team. How the uh, the team's chemistry. It's really it's really to. Uh, it's really hard to get real chemistry for the for the team, right? Sometimes the founders are very very cool, very uh, very strong. Uh, they have very strong background, but they, they cannot work together, right? I found many. I found uh, like fifty percent of my Chinese portfolio company has founder problems. They end up broke up. Uh, so I think it's two point. Uh, the third point is uh, you know I think it's also the most important. The important point is that the if the company's idea is very is trendy. So we did we did a lot of research, right? Uh, I, about what's what's going on in the market and uh, what's what's gonna happen in the future. We did a lot of a lot of research about it. That's what we do every day. Um, I can I can tell you guys a lot about what what is trend trendy thing. But one thing uh, I, I want to share with you guys: if anything appear on the news. It's it's not it's not hot. It's not good for us to invest. It's already too late. 
Uh, so for other investors like us, we, we try to find the best people. We, uh, we, we try to spend a lot of time on, on, on the deals, deals you know, try to create a community with like, good people. Uh, this is for the investment investment side. And for the fundraising side, I can tell you uh, tell you guys a little bit more about uh, my story. So I raised uh, 100 million dollars cash, US dollar, from um, 50, 60 different parties, uh, including as I mentioned, including uh, internet companies, uh, person, uh, individuals, uh, family offices, and uh, you know, uh, even some state-owned companies. I think uh, the best way to raise money is you know you, you have to tell, you you have to pick the best time to raise money. So when I raised my first fund, it was in, in a special time where the Chinese government pushed uh, entrepreneurship. There used to be that entrepreneurship is the least important thing uh, in, in China, and 2014 to 2015 became the most popular topic in China. So I raised my first first fund that, uh, during that time when I was 24 years old. And then, uh, second important thing is you have to you have to tell like a cool, very cool story that is different from other people. So my story was I'm Chinese, but I'm living in Silicon Valley. I can do both American deals and Chinese deals. Uh, that one was very special. Uh, so I tend to be the first in the market. And third, I think you have to be very honest about all like all your track record. You have to. Have very very good reputation. This is the most important thing. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have experience, or or it doesn't matter if you uh, ever be in the in industry. You have to have very good reputation from your peers, from your from everybody. From, uh, but most definitely going to be your peers. So three points. Absolutely. Um, and also, Wei was very humble when he was talking about his deals. I mean, Moaz and I, what we were talking in the room together earlier, and we were saying how Wei is one of the most active angel investors. And Moaz was telling the story of how he first invested. You should share that story, actually. Yeah, sure. We sat down um, in a conference room, and Wei looked at me and listened to me for five minutes, looked at his phone for five minutes, and he said, okay, great, I'm ready to invest. And I was like, I'm not sure you paid attention to anything I've said. <laughs> uh, and I had no idea how to make that decision. And then the next day, I was like, I texted him and I was like, are you sure? Because uh, I'm not sure that that was, I think you made this decision in the heat of the moment. Um, so the first five minutes, I, I, I was very focused. I listened to your story, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the next first five, five minutes, I was like, hey, do you need some water? <laughs> yeah, so the next five minutes, when I opened my phone, I was using my dictionary, my Chinese English dictionary to check what is deodorant. <laughs> so I didn't know what is the over until you told me. So yeah, so that, that's 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 uh, for a listed company, we have 50 bullet points. I can share with you guys later. We have more time, but yeah. yeah. So for follow-up reading materials, um, if you guys have any recommendations, especially what we said about the bullet points, um, I'm happy to share with uh, the facilitators from the class and send it out and share it with everyone. Um, so now you get to see the story from both the founder's perspective and the investor's perspective. So sometimes if as the entrepreneur you're going to fundraise and you're sitting in a meeting and feeling terrified, it might not be as scary as you think it is and people are actually really trying to make an effort to understand what you're doing because investors are there to support you. Um, so now I also want to move on to Ash to talk a little bit more about what it's like from a corporate perspective. Um, because obviously, uh, way invests at the very early stage from Angel being the first investor, um, but you come in at a slightly later stage. So tell us a little bit more about your job. Yeah, and I guess investing is a um, very vast, wide topic at Alphabet. Um, we obviously have our um, investing arms like GB, um, which is from Google Ventures, and Capital G, which is from Google Capital. Um, and they are just like any Silicon Valley investor. They don't think about what's strategic to Google or not. They invest in companies that are competitive to Google often. Um, but they're looking at ROI. They're a way for Google to use its balance sheet and get returns on its capital. Um, and so that's that part of investing. And for, for most of what they do, um, they sort of 
you know, corp dev doesn't get involved at all. Uh, they very much uh, pick their investments, do them, and go through whatever approval and investing committee processes they have. Um, and we don't, we actually don't see the stuff. And even when we've acquired companies uh, that they've invested in, um, we have to get NDAs in place and stuff with the company. So it's not sort of like a, you know, a, a permeated law where like all this information is just going from them to us. It's, it's actually very uh, controlled. So they're independent. They would function like they're any other. Totally investor. independent. Yeah. They, their benefit is though they get to like, you know, they have the wealth of Google resources behind them, so they can say like, oh well, how does Google think about this, and how's the market thinking about this, and do we think that this company has you know, the right perspective or something? So um, uh, and they have access to other like, to, to, uh, advisors and stuff. Um, Are you coming? Yeah, so we're on the Google corporate side, um, and so Google corporate does do investments, but they're very strategic in nature, um, and so they often are larger check sizes. Um, Google does invest in, in some things that are much smaller, but we're not writing like ten thousand dollar checks or fifty thousand dollar checks. It just doesn't make sense for a corporation, um, and uh, so we're often doing later stage investing. Um, but I think like what these guys said is universally important, which is um, like the things that you tell any founder, no matter what stage they're in, is like uh, focus on building a great product. If you have a great product, uh, people will try and make a deal happen. They'll want to acquire you or invest in you or whatever that is, um, and that's the best position you can be in. Is something that really speaks for itself. Um, the second thing is like have a really high bar for a team. As an act, as an acquirer, um, oftentimes it's not, and we'll have the best experience on this on this panel, but. Um, when we're acquiring a team, like we want that team to continue and like continue building the product, and whether that is the product in the way that we acquired it, or you know rebuilding it on our platform, whatever that might be, um, the team is a large uh, part of the acquisition itself. And so, if you don't have a strong team, um, then they, you know we may not be able to take everybody, or um, or it just it, you know the, the deal value may not make sense if like you built this large team and only a handful of people really fit. Um, with the acquirer. So make sure that you've got a really high bar for hiring and why you're hiring and, and what that, that person is going to be doing um, long term. Um, and then the final thing is uh, fundraise judiciously. Um, you know, even as an acquirer, as large as Google, just because somebody's raised some ridiculous amounts of cash, we have a lot of cash on the balance sheet, but we're still very thoughtful um, just to use our capital the right way. And so, uh, you know, if somebody's raised a ton of money that doesn't make sense for us to get return on that money, then it may not make sense for us to do the deal. And so we often say, well, the valuation is too rich for us either to invest or to acquire. So don't think that, you know, like it doesn't matter sort of how much money you raise and some of these larger companies will be able to um, to take a lot of that in. They're they're just as uh, they're just as thoughtful about how they use the capital to, to do the acquisitions and the investments. We've walked away from investment rounds. So for students, do you share a little bit more about how you look at valuation? What would be something that's considered as too high and how you would come to that judgment? So uh, both of us are private and that previously less of bankers, and so that comes naturally. But do explain a little bit more. Yeah, valuation is, uh, first of all, it's an art, not a science. It's in the eye of the beholder. Um, valuation to an investor may look very different than to an acquirer. Um, a company, you know, like somebody may say, I'm willing to put $30 million into you and uh, I think you're valued at least $100 million. That, that may not look the same to a Google, that may not look the same to another investor. Um, so it very much is in the eye of the beholder. So don't think about, valuation is a signal from the market, but it's not an absolute signal for everybody in the market. So I think that's um, one thing. If you, oftentimes on the Google side, um, we acquire companies at all different stages, ones that have revenue. We do typical sort of valuation analyses that, um, that I'm sure you guys have all been exposed to, so DCFs and public comps and, um, uh, and uh, private comparables too, like what are other VCs pricing the market at. Um, but then a big part of what we think about is uh, go forward in integration on an acquisition. If we're acquiring a company, um, we have to think about, well, we have this product, are we going to continue to sell the product or do we have to shut it down? Um, if we are going to continue to sell it, we've got to get all these companies on board with privacy and security and compliance that a small company probably doesn't need to worry about, but a company like Google 
does need to worry about, which we quite heavily and our standards um, are sort of on a, 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 on a pretty high level. Um, and then, you know, all the go forward integration too. So we think about valuation from not just of what happens at the time of acquisition, but to make this product successful, what, um, or this team successful, what does that mean from a go forward um, investment into this team or this effort? Um, and so that's how we think about it. So I think like valuation is, is you know, lots of companies come to us, well, so-and-so VC just valued us at, you know, at this multiple against something. That just may not make sense to us because you know it's not recognized, or we may be doing the acquisition not for the revenue, but for the team and the technology. And so that valuation again can be very different than what uh, what the market may tell you. Absolutely. Um, so obviously, everyone sitting in the audience might go on then into different roles. Um, they may be, you may become founders yourselves, or you might become investors, or you might end up joining a corporate and working as an investor. Uh, from a corporate perspective or uh, on the corp dev team. So it would be great to have each of you share kind of the best practices or top lessons that you've learned in your current role over the past couple of years. So how do you have you go first if you're comfortable? Um, I think the best lessons that I've learned, I, like I'm completely, I'm daily blown away by the, uh, the level of uh, intelligence and thoughtfulness the colleagues that I work with at Google, there's some of these people are like the smartest people in the world. Um, and they also still have questions. So I think like my biggest mistake when I started was I felt like it was too stupid to ask the question in the room. Like, you know, here are all these PhDs and AI and ML, or they had done, you know, there's MD PhDs at Google. I mean, you can like name the backgrounds and they exist. Um, and to sit in a room with all these engineering and product leads or executives, you sort of feel like, well, I can't ask the question. Um, questions are always should be asked, and I think of que like asking questions as a like. They're actually. It's not that there's no stupid question. There are <laughs> definitely stupid questions. I think though the time that you have to ask the really basic questions starts to diminish. So if you're getting into something early on, ask the really basic questions if you don't understand like. What is deodorant? I don't know. Uh, you know, like it wouldn't have made sense if he hadn't checked that until you know years later when he was like, "Hey, uh, I invest in your company. I have no idea what you do." Like that would have been not a great question at that time. Uh, so I think like ask the questions, ask them early, ask them often, um, so that you could be learning. And I think at that point nobody will sort of bat an eye. Three weeks and you know three months, three years into a process, and you say, "Hey, I'm actually not sure what you guys are doing." People say, "Well, what have you been doing for the last time?" So, um, I think that's what I'm Probably the uh, honesty, like um, you really want to be, when you're building a business, first you want to be honest with yourself as to what's, uh, as to what's working and what's not and where your strengths are and where they aren't. Um, for me, it was clear that our business was working when it came to certain types of advertising, when it came to digital advertising in particular, and it wasn't working when it came to influencer advertising or um, raising money or, or operational um, success. Like there were a lot of problems we had in business. Uh, early on, and it was clear to me where I was, where I was strong, and where I wasn't, and we hired where I wasn't, and I tried to focus on where I was strong. Um, and two, I think what's really important is honesty with investors and acquirers. Like, um, you know, since, since I sold Native, I've been working a bunch of businesses, and I can't tell you the number of businesses that have sent decks, and when you dig into the numbers, the numbers don't match what they told you earlier. Or when they tell you something, you know, on Thursday and on Sunday they tell you something that's completely different. Um, you know, I have a memory that lasts longer than three days. And so um, some of the times I, I'm just like, I, I know this isn't true because you told me this isn't true earlier. Um, and, and so when we, uh, when we created, uh, you know, when we were selling the business, for instance, we audited our own financial statements multiple times. I rebuilt them from the ground up to make sure I knew where every number was. If someone asked me, what did you spend this $13 on on Amazon in July 2016, I would have an answer. Um, and uh, like we built in buffers in case there was mistakes. Um, and, and so there was a lot of like honesty when we were selling the business. And also, we were honest about where our problems were. Um, we were like, hey, we're, we're digitally native, um, but we're not good at understanding how to sell to brick and mortar stores and how to sell to, how to sell deodorant at Target and Walmart. We're not good at running TV ads. Um, you know, we, um, you know, at, at the time we didn't even own our own trademark. 
And so every presentation had to be like, here's this huge skeleton in our closet that we're going to have to talk about. Um, and, and like we didn't try and hide it. We said it, and, and like I said it in front of everybody. And it's like, I want to I want to establish this rapport where uh, you think that you're getting real and genuine information from me, and I'm not trying to hide things from you. Uh, because once, uh, like if you get the feeling that I'm trying to hide things from you, you're not going to want to do this. Um, and that was probably the most important thing that I, I think I learned was being honest with myself and with others, um, because that's the only way you can build up. Uh, I think there's a couple of things that I've learned. Uh, number one, you have to admit that most success is based on the timing. Uh, so all the big su success, either you know, uh, Tencent or Alibaba, from my, my shareholders, you know, the, as the founder of them, they told me it's, it's all about timing. They didn't know nothing at that to, at that time when they, when they built the company. Uh, even for Jinri Tokyo, right? It's, it's the largest private company right now. But about eight years ago, it was nothing, it was zero. So I asked them uh, what's really going on. They told me it's it's the right time. Like mobile internet came, and then they, they were shifting the right right hand, and uh, they, they tried to build the best product. And for you guys, same. It's uh, it's 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 the timing. Like you work very hard. Sometimes the result wasn't good, but, and you try to think. You try to think there's anything wrong with you or your team. Uh, it's probably you, you should think bigger. It's probably because of timing. As well. That's one thing. Number two is uh, you have to you have to be confident about uh, everything you do. So when I uh, drop out from the college, uh, drop out from my MBA, uh, I uh, wasn't sure what what I should try to next step. But I'm always confident about my decision about you know what I have in my hand. You know, I, I uh, didn't go to the best school. Uh, you know, my my grade was was very bad. I just told you that I almost fell all my class, like all, literally all my class. But I but I understand. Well, I have some I have something in my hand. I can speak two languages. I understand two cultures and uh, I understand two business cultures, right? I, I saw the you know there's a huge amount of money dumping from China into Silicon Valley, and they need a translator, right? So always, po always positive, always confidence about yourself. There's something you are special in the world. You're very unique in the world. So find the point that fit, fit you. And then number three, uh, the third point is uh, always think what you can offer to, to the people you are talking to. Do not think what, what you can what you can get, but think what you can offer. Right. Uh, it's it's really hard to do that. So when I do my business, I, I have two business. I have my co-working space, and maybe some of the Chinese students know my uh, my co-working business. And I have my VC firm. Uh, so I always ask my, my question: What I can offer to my customers, to my investors, right? Um, you know, if you can offer as many uh, product or as many things as possible, you'll be super successful. So I always think what you can offer, even though you are students. So three points. Um, and so we talked about kind of what your job looks like and some of the top lessons. Um, and I, I actually would love to hear a little bit more stories about kind of your day-to-day -day work. Um, so what would be some of the things you consider as your toughest challenges and proudest accomplishments? Please. So um, I'm. I'm very positive, positive. Right? so I don't, I don't think there's like a real big challenge for me. But every day there's like very uh, small challenge, and the challenge tend to like change in different stage of my business. Like when when I first dropped off from college, I think my my, my challenge was, was find a proper job, right? So uh, it, it, it didn't work very well. I did not find a job. Uh, but later, when I read my first one, I think my my, cha my challenge was to, you know, to get uh, to let some people know me, to accept my money. That was my challenge back then. And then um, my recent challenge, I think, should be uh, you know, to manage people. We have like 80 people. I have to I have to pay it, I have to you know pay 80 people. They're pretty big team for investment firm. Um, so I think the challenge for me is to how to manage them, how to make my team happy, how to make their work more efficiency, increasing the, their efficiency. And um, yeah, um, every day there's very small challenge. I, 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 yeah.
proudest accomplishments or accomplishments? Oh, I, I think the, the, the uh, accomplishment is, you know, um, I help a lot of people. You know, the, uh, I help you, I help, yeah. I help, I help a, lot of, uh, a lot of people from different parts of the world. They do different business, right? Uh, I think I'm, I'm very happy and I feel, you know, I feel, I feel helpful for the, these people who, who make great success in their business with my help. And uh, I, I think that's it. Yeah. Wei well, has definitely given me very helpful advice, so it's a good, proud accomplishment to have. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, my, my life back in school, I think my, my, uh, my idea was to make a lot of money. But uh, when I tried very hard to make a lot of money, it's it's not gonna work. Right? Every time when I when I think the best idea, I best idea to 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 uh, execute that, it's eventually it's shutting down. It's not gonna work. But when you think about how you can use yourself to help more people, and then the, the results. Is, is different. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Um. So the question, the first question was, what were some of the challenges, the, the, challenges. the toughest challenges you had to overcome? Um, I, I think for us it was building like a, a scalable model early on. Like um, we didn't have a bunch of cash to burn on customer acquisition, so like you know you'll see some, you'll see a lot of di uh, direct consumer businesses raise a fortune, um, and generally they end up spending 40, 50 percent of that amount on on ads, on, it's what makes Google so successful and it's what makes Facebook so successful. Um, and what we did is we figured out a way to build a business that like um, made money. So rather than spend, um, you know, 25, rather than spend $25 to get a customer who earned you $5, which is what shockingly a bunch of businesses do, um, we were able to spend a dollar to get a customer who earned you $5. Uh, and like, uh, you know, going back to your original point, Wade, which was, um, timing, it was almost exclusively timing that got us that way. Like, you know, we, we, we spent a good amount of time and money on Facebook ads, and in 2012, I, mean, I started running Facebook ads in 2012, and the only thing you could hope for was somebody like liking your post. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I used to like, um, I, I analogized it to basically like a revolutionary war campaign, where like today, uh, Facebook and Google are with sniper rifles. So if I want to target a person who wears a hat, um, with a letter C, I could probably find that on Facebook. Um, and, and that's amazing. I'm a sniper rifle when I'm advertising. And back in 2012, it was like a revolutionary war cannon, and you pointed it in this direction. And sometimes a cannonball went over there and got you customers, and sometimes it exploded in your face. More often than not, it was the latter. Uh, so timing was certainly a huge component in terms of building our business. Um, but really, like getting that machine, getting that marketing machine working early on was our toughest challenge. Um, as we started to grow and hire people, it, it definitely became managing people. Um, and I'll be the first to admit, I'm a terrible person. I'm terrible at managing people. I don't enjoy it. I don't want to do one-on-one -on -one meetings. I want to go, I want to get my hands dirty and do genuine work and not help, not mentor people in the way I should. Uh, I, I think at one point, I, you know, I hope to grow up and be able to mentor people. But it's not something I'm interested in right now. Uh, and like people have left their jobs and made it as a result of that, and, and I completely sympathize and empathize with that. It's just who I am. Um, and we've hired people to sort of help be mentors, um, but I'd say that's a, that's a challenge I consistently deal with, um, and something I'm getting slightly better at, but I have a ton of work to do. Like I imagine at Google, you know, there's a very formal, structured process about mentorship and reviews and like how to like grow in your job. Yeah, I mean, uh, each area is different, but yeah, for sure. Like as you move up, you could probably be an individual contributor. But the way to sort of like get bigger and bigger scope is to have teams that build things for you, right? Up yeah. Up yeah, you can leverage other people. Um, and for for us, we're starting to get better at that, um, particularly with the help of PG, which has been fantastic, actually. Like, um, helping mentor me to be a better mentor. Um, but I, I think that's still my greatest challenge. Could you talk a little bit more about what it's like to now function as an independent subsidiary at P&G? So what is post-acquisition life like? Yeah, um, so we were the first acquisition they did in about a decade. Um, and so I think both from, like I remember when we were like, 
what happened is when we were running the process, we hired an investment banker, they shopped the business around to a bunch of companies, including P&G. Nobody knew how P&G operated as an acquirer in the market because nobody had seen them before out there, uh, or they hadn't in the last decade. And so, um, you know, didn't really know what to expect. Um, I'll tell you, I've been pleasantly surprised. Um, you know, they promised to keep us an independent subsidiary, and that's sort of what, that, that's what's happened. We have our own office, we have our own team. A lot of other companies would have acquired us, basically integrated us with wherever they are. So if we were acquired by Unilever, they would have been like, okay, everyone move to New Jersey and sit in this conference room and work here until, um, you know, you hate this job so much, you quit. Um, which would have happened really quickly. Um, but instead, they're like, keep running this business independently. So we have our own office, we run our own marketing, we have our own p and um, uh, And by p I mean we run our own profit and loss statement. So as we generate revenue, we keep it separate from P&G's books and just uh, on a monthly basis sort of pipe those numbers over to P&G so they can report about them. Um, but otherwise, it's been a fantastic process as a result of that. Uh, I'll tell you the greatest um, difference has been the desire to grow and the scale that we have to grow. So, you know, when we sold the business, we were probably a $40, $50 million a year business. Um, you know, P&G is a $65 billion a year business. Uh, you know, a $40 million a year business is not interesting to a $65 billion business. And so, um, you know, if we don't, if, look, so there, there's a mandate to grow, and a mandate to grow really quickly so that we can, um, you know, actually have a huge effect on P&G. Um, I, I think we have a large effect on P&G ourselves from a cultural perspective, but certainly not from a, uh, you know, EBITDA perspective. Um, and, and so that's been uh, really interesting, because now all of a sudden, when we were not VC backed, uh, you know, we cared more about, like, well, I mean, we still care about our profit and losses, but now we have a, a huge mandate to grow. Uh, and that's one of the most interesting part about it. Uh, um, I've been trying to come up with something that I can make. I had many challenges. It's not that I don't. Just one that would be interesting enough to talk about. Um, and I think, like, nothing tops being a mom. So, like, maybe that's why. I just, like, you should all go home and have your parents. Like, the amount, of, the amount of work they put in that you will never know. Until you become a parent, and then you'll say, "No, I'm not going to be Um Yeah, like nothing feels like worse than that. Um, I think my, I would say like my proudest accomplishment probably comes from the toughest challenges, which is um, I feel like in my career I've always opened the door to like another universe every time I've moved forward. So like as an undergrad, I was in biomedical engineering. This was like early 2000s. If I met, you know, people like literally companies would ask me like if I invented the major. And I was like, no, it's an actual science. <laughs> um, because then it was like people are just like, well, do you know Java and do you know C and you know can you code and can you uh, can you you know like help us design silicon chips and stuff? And I was like, nope, can't do any of that. Uh, and so that like sort of pushed me to thinking about well, what am I going to do with this degree, which I thought was a very good degree. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and that pushed me into like, well, I gotta teach myself how to code. And so that was it. Like I found, a, I worked in consulting, um, but mostly to like develop and implement systems. And so I taught myself how to code. Uh, and then, you know, that grew over some time. And I was like, well, you can't just code by yourself. You gotta manage some teams to code. And I was like, I don't know the first thing about managing anybody. I'm like 23 years old. Uh, and it was like, well, you've got to learn, and you've got the software team in India. And so I think he's like, that pushed me to the next level. Got there, and I realized, well, why are you know? I became this like integration expert. So it was like the cleanup crew when two companies merged, and we're like, oh, there's all this trash on the ground. Can you just like figure out how these two companies should talk to each other? And I was like, what moron decided that these two companies should be talking to each other? Uh, now I'm that moron, but like the the you know just like. That piece of it was like, well, where are these decisions happening? I don't even understand who makes these decisions and why they make them. And I quickly realized like, I had to get a really deep um, understanding of corporate finance and decision making. Um, and so I went into business school and I like, uprooted my career, which I thought was going great. Um, I went into business school. And then when I was in business school, again, realized like, hey, if you want to understand this, like investment banking is the quickest way to get this. And I thought, you know, I like resisted it for as long as possible. I said, you know what, 
we're just going to dive in. I was one of the oldest associates, I think, um, or one of the older associates in the class, and it was like, well, but I'm going to have to learn this, and this is the best way to learn it. So I think, like, and each one of those doors just opened this, like, new possibility. Classmates in business school came from amazing backgrounds um, of careers or experiences I didn't think were possible. Um, and so I think it's, like, jumping in, like, you know, head first into things that are really uncomfortable and things you don't know how to do. Um, it's not that bad once you're there, and it seems really easy when you're on the other side of it, even though it seems terrifying. Uh, and so my best example of that was, again, not work related, but I'd never been camping or I didn't grow up snowboarding or skiing. Um, it's not fun in the Northeast to go skiing. It's like ice. It's just awful. I get it in California now. Um, but I, you know, I didn't grow up in that, and I thought, well, uh, if there was a chance to go to Antarctica as part of a business school trip, and I was like, I'm there. And everybody that knew me was like, you're insane. You've never gone camping. We're <clears throat> on the ice for eight days, not indoors at all. Um, I had never uh, done any snow activities, and it involved ice climbing and snowshoeing <laughs> and cross-country skiing, and I'd never put on a pair of skis. But I think that's, like, the perfect example of, it was, I mean, I wouldn't do it again, but like I'm so glad I did it because it just reminded me that you really can do, literally, I mean, it's such a cheesy thing, but you really can do it. You just have to like take the first step and start it and then be on the other side. Before you I think that's a perfect point to open up to questions um, because now that we've talked about, uh, you know, best practices, uh, toughest challenges, we're also continuing to grow, um, but Every single day we're doing things that are meaningful, that are interesting, that are continuing to stretch ourselves. So I think it's a really good uh, point to open up to the audience. Um, if any of you have any questions, um, whether it's about fundraising, building a business, what Corp Dev is like, anything like that, um, we're all here for you. Yeah, please. Okay, so um, my partner and I are a team of two. Um, we're trying to build a recruiting platform for undergrad students to organize their recruiting. So it's similar to like CRM, but on the other side for actual recruits to organize their recruiting, whether they're in banking, engineering, or like public policy. Um, and we're, we've been in talk with like two different angels and we're going to be demoing uh, one of them on May 1st. So we're wondering like how much should we raise and like what is a good amount to start? Like I projected that we're going to be spending like $400 a month like at a bare minimum, that's like no Mailchimp, like no Zendesk, no like automation software that we have to pay for. So, could you maybe you two guys give like some advice in terms of like what is a healthy amount to raise to like make good on our promise as well as like to actually have like a sustainable business? Uh, sure. I, I'd say one is um, try and figure out what you want to raise. Uh, like, how much money are you like? What do you need the money for? Okay, you need Mailchimp and you need a couple other services. Um, I'm sure you can pick, like, $400 a month is literally not it. Yeah. Um, and no, nobody's going to be interested in giving you, you know, $5,000. Like, um, if you pitch somebody and say, hey, I'm raising $5,000, it's like, burn is $400 a month. <laughs> you could have Wade's reaction now, would be like, Wade would be like, here's, here's my credit card. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, $400 you can get from friends and family, and that's not, like, um, what you'd go to an angel for. I'd say, like, uh, one, if you need that little money, go get $4,000 from friends and family to, to see if you can do that, and then go build, like, see how far you can get with that business um, without trying to raise any money. Um, otherwise, like, and also, like, yeah, I mean, it sounds like you have a business that doesn't require a lot of capital. Go build that business rather than try to fundraise. But otherwise, if you think that, hey, I actually do need money, and here are the 20 ways I would spend that money, then, then you can have that conversation. Like when we were raising money, you know, or when we were when we were doing 20 million, 30 million in revenue a year, people were begging us to take their money. But in reality, like we were like, no, we don't want your money. We have no way to spend this money. Uh, and so, if we have no way to spend this money, why would we take it? So I think what you should say, okay, this is why, this is where I would spend money, um, and this is how much money I need. Uh, in order to be able to, you know, start this business for the next six months or 12 months. Um, is that an amount that's interesting to an angel investor? Um, if it's $5,000, it's absolutely not. You should find that money through friends and family. Um, that would be my advice. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think it's perfect advice. So um, I'll add, add on a little bit. I think the, the stage you have, you should go to some uh, accelerator, like Skydive. Yeah. Or uh, you know, let them to figure out what's your evaluation. But typically, for stage like you guys, you're a student, right? Correct, yeah, we both are. So like, when you enter in an hours, evaluation. Market price, but as Ash mentioned, market price is just market price. It's not accurate. It's not that accurate. And then uh, it really depends on what kind of accelerator you are, you are going. Like if you straight go to YC, right? It's after graduate from YC, it's ten million valuation, which is not that reasonable for us. Mm -hmm. But uh, a good thing about YC is there's huge demand of new assets. Huge, but a lot of all the nests that are uh, on demo day, so you can pitch on them. And then it, it's a demand, it, your problem is a demand supply problem, right? If your idea is attract, uh, attract a lot of investors, they'll set up a valuation for you. Okay, yeah. That, like that $400 is like the super conservative, like bare bounds, like what we need just to like host the actual product and like run a few like marketing campaigns, but I mean, we could definitely keep up spending. To like gain my customers, but it's yeah, super conservative. Like I, I would see, uh, like my question, uh, like uh, what I would suggest is go build as much of the business as you can in okay. six months without yeah. spending it. Like um, you need Mailchimp, forget it. Use Gmail, right? right. Uh, emails and Gmail, and use Streak, which is a free service to send out, like you know, uh, mail merchants. Um, go feel, go see how much you can build uh, of this business without spending one dollar. Um, and, and once you're like, holy cow, this business is really working. I, I need to raise money because I can't keep doing this. Then go do that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, if you if you can get a super conservative burn of four hundred dollars a month, that's fantastic. That's what you should aim for. Okay. So it's actually a great thing that your burn is low. And I was actually going to add on top of that when Moyes was talking about build a real business, he means like get real revenue, right? So building a business is about actually like once you have your product, someone's willing to pay you for it. So if you're if you're using four hundred dollars a month to build something, but you're not paying anything for it, that's not a real business, right? So definitely validate that by getting someone to even if they're paying for a dollar, as long as someone's willing to pay something, that is a really good validation. And you were about to add. Yeah, completely agree. Like get users on both sides of the marketplace um, and see what you can do with zero money to spend. And yeah, people if people are willing to pay you, you know, even a dollar, like. Um, you know what P what P and G does is that they always run these surveys in like classrooms like this, and they get um, information that I, I don't. Really know. What I, what we say is like, look, we're going to create a product and sell it to consumers. When they give us money for it, we know that we have something that's good. Um, and, and like in a classroom setting, all you get is like um, information that doesn't mean that much. Uh, and, and so go see if you can do something with it. Go try and get you know. 50 customers on both sides of that marketplace, or 50 people on both sides of that marketplace. If you can do that and they're engaged, you have a real, you might you have a real business. Okay. That's a good question. Yes. Um, I was close to way. So like you said, you started being like a VC, like super super young with your own money. Um, like how do you recommend going about that? Be like not being able to like raise institutional money, and like say like you like people come to you for like angel checks, but you can only write such like small size checks, how do you actually like establish yourself and then gain credibility for the whole process? Uh, great question. So, so I was fortunate to learn VC when I was super young. And then um, I think the good thing about you, by using your own money, you had a chance to practice. So I start with $100, so $100 to, to invest some deals on crowdfunding platform. There are so many crowdfunding platform, right? Uh, the only thing I did I did differently was I invest them by uh, invest all the founders by hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, but ask them to uh, go out, have dinner or have coffee with me. You, know, you talk to the actual founders, talk to the actual person, right? And then you get a better experience of how to communicate with these people, right? And then uh, and then another thing is all the capital in the market in the market tend to be more uh, decentralized. There's, there's many kind of uh, dif different money. There's institutional money. There's a lot of different kind of office. And then uh, there's also a lot of smaller funds. So it's not it's not that hard to raise money uh, right now. Uh, so my suggestion, you know, my advice is if you want to do some VC, you can start by using your own money. And then if, if, the, if the results 
uh, pretty positive inquiries from your friends. You can tell them, hey, I, I have some very good like deals for you, tech deals. Because there's, you guys are in Silicon Valley, there's, you know, 99.9 people, oh, 99.9% 99 .9 of the people didn't have access to Silicon Valley, right? They're living outside of Silicon Valley, right? You can pitch these people who want to do deals here, but they're not physically here, right? Not that hard. And unless you have even better result, you go another level and talk to bigger investors, bigger family office, bigger institutional investors. But my point is, uh, you know, being a young VC is an advantage. You have a better understanding of consumer tech, you have a better understanding of all the, you know, social apps because you guys are the, are the you know, users, right? Thank you. So I think that's really practical advice. Um, I just wanted to add some structure onto that, which is if you look at the work that investors do, there's typically four steps, right? So investors have to fundraise themselves to have funding, and if you're investing your own capital, then you already have that in place. And then you have to be able to source and make judgment on deals, right? The third step is being able to help companies that you actually invest in. So if you're providing just money and no additional support, it's not really helpful because all money is green. And so by the end of, I mean, at the end of the day, unless they're really looking for just money, um, it's better if you can help the startups that you're investing in a unique way. And then lastly is thinking about how you're actually going to generate a return. So if you're being an investor, then one of your key objectives is to actually be able to generate a return for your investors. So thinking about how you're going to exit. Um, and out of those four steps, I mean, Wade talked about how you get started. And so when you're thinking about this, also think about what your value add is, right? So in each of these steps, what are some of the unique things that you can do differently than other people? Thank you. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? Uh, no, no. Can I add a little question to that? Yeah, please. Yeah. Can you uh, go deeper in a little bit how you learned in the beginning? About Me? Yeah. How I learned in the beginning? Uh, I think the best learning process is, is, is when, when the company start to, start to fail, right? Like by using your money, you could buy a lot of things, you could buy a car, right? But you're using your car money to invest in a stupid company and it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's shutting down, right? And then you learn a lot. Uh, through the process, I had, and then this one uh, learning process. Another, another learning process is you know try to look as many deals as as possible before you actually put in your own money. There's a lot of open source platform, open platform you can find deals, right? There's open demo days. There's Skydeck demo days, right? I believe in Berkeley, right? There's a couple others. And then you, you Talk to the founders. Talk to the this. There's a founder right there, right? Talk to the founder um, nearby, and then you you each time you learn a little bit. Try to talk. So I talk to thousands of founder before I using my my own money. Right? I talk to my friends. You know, who have small ideas. I, I you know exchange idea with him. Uh, and then you know you learn two best learning uh, way. Number one is you fail. You learn a lot. Number two is you know, um, uh, you try to look at the deal you missed. I miss DoorDash. You try to read, like, read the, you try to read first check from me, DoorDash, five years ago. When I, uh, six years ago, when I was in college. And I was like, this, this uh, there's no barrier to entry for this idea. So I didn't, uh, I didn't invest in the company. I miss Gott, a shoe company. I don't, I don't know if you guys know the, the company. Uh, so, Founder came to me right after demo days. So I passed that deal, uh, and now it's a new company. So, best way to learn is from your uh, actual failure uh, in practice. Yeah, please. I'll go ahead first. So, I think this is a question for both Wei and Wolf. What would you say were the biggest mistakes? you guys make and how did you bounce back? It's a tough question. Okay, I make, I, I make mistakes every single day, every single minute. But my my idea is I never I never look all the like m smaller mistakes, but once there's bigger mistakes that affect your business a little bit, you know, you um you know, you, you have to spend time to 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 to, to think. So I my idea is, is to just 
for example, small, smaller mistakes, but you know, um, try to rethink the big mistakes. I, I just as I mentioned to uh, uh, him, you know, like if I, I only think to when I mistake the outside. I, you know, I try to I try to learn from. Uh, I think from my perspective, it was probably hiring as we were growing the company, and then how we um, how we listen to the employees. Uh, so the way we, when we were growing, um, the, the way I thought about it was okay, well, let's just hire soldiers and not generals. So like soldiers are on the front line doing the dirty work um, and getting the job done, um, and we never hired generals to sort of think about the big strategic picture. Um, I think that was a mistake. Um, and I think possibly a larger mistake was that um, we didn't have generals, but at some point I started listening to the people as if they were generals. Um, and that was because that was all we had. And so, you know, you, you, you talk to your team and like you have the soldiers on there. And the soldiers were fantastic at getting their job done and like, um, you know, defeating the enemy uh, for lack of a better term. But we start, I started listening to them as if they were generals um, instead of continuing to focus on what I knew was working. Um, and I think that was a big mistake as well. Oh, I, I, one, I, I have one more thing. Uh, so I mentioned timing, right? I think I made one big make mistake was uh, I, can, I could raise more money when I uh, back three years ago. And I was like, I'll just stop raising. I want to do a smaller deal first and grow slowly. And then after that, it's almost not possible to raise money from China. So, what I learned from there is, usually the timing or the biggest opinion only happened once, and it goes very fast. Yeah, that's one yeah, that's a great point. In fact, I'm gonna change my answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> like when we launched, you know, we were seeing the cost of customer acquisition at something like two dollars <coughs> in the first year, uh, like a ridiculously low amount um, based on our metrics. Like for every, uh, the way I put it is that we had this vending machine. You put in two dollars, you hit a one, and ten dollars came out. Um, and we were like slowly putting in the money in there instead of throwing in as much as possible because it was working so well. Um, and like Warren Buffett has this great saying where he's like, "When it's raining, opportunity put out buckets, not thimbles." Like, um, and I think like we also missed that. Like, you know, we we did a decent job, and like you know, hindsight is one twenty, both for Wade and for me. Um, but it was raining opportunity for us three years ago. Um, and put out, I put out a thin ball, um, and I shouldn't put out, you know, a uh, horse, but like I got a bucket. Um, I think I would probably add it from the other side, although you said it already, which is the biggest mistakes that I've seen some writers make is um, not being able to deals and nothing brings a deal to a halt, like a surprise. Uh, that nobody was expecting. It doesn't matter if it's a good one, it's good, but uh, if it's a bad one, it's catastrophic. And so just be forthcoming and honest because nobody likes this. <laughs> so uh, uh, my name is Jackie, I'm the engineer at Amazon. So I got two questions, one for Wei and one for Moi. So the for Wei is more like a, a for follow-up question for timing. So we mentioned the uh, you already got the news, and it's probably too late. And how you can tell if it's good timing versus bad timing? How you pick the best timing when you evaluate uh, uh, startups? Uh, I think for me, we have an advantage because, like as I mentioned, we understand both Chinese business culture and U.S. business culture, and that represent like the world to largest market, right? So there's a time lag. There's time gap, right, between these two countries. Um, that's what, uh, like, your alumni, soon was soon English. Yeah. No, you're talking about SoftBank. SoftBank, yeah. That's what he made his great deal, right? He sold Yahoo, and then he like in U.S. Uh, what what uh, he saw uh, uh, Amazon in U.S. and then he invest Alibaba. And then it turns out the best deal he ever done, right? Same thing for me. I think that the, the time difference between these two markets is getting uh, it's, it's getting smaller, the gap. But there's still a little bit of timing difference, so we can learn from there. 
And right now, if you open your app, you, the US market, open the app, you, you can see a lot of apps is learning from the, the, the Chinese apps. But five years ago, all the Chinese apps are learning from uh, US apps, right? So you, you get, a, this is an easy way to, to, you know, to, to find the, the timing between for us. Another thing is, um, you know, you, you have to have the ability connecting the very manual knowledge, right? That's, that's a really hard skill. Right. So you, you have to read different books, you have to read a lot of news, you know, you have to talk to different people, different experts, right? You have to build, build your own expert network. And usually the like, manual important message from like from from nowhere, it's from the shadow, it's not easy to to find, right? I, I, but I found I know the best best salesperson is it's not a salesperson in Louis Vuitton, it's a salesperson who drives like cap back in China, right? So those kind of information or important people are not in your regu regular daily way to find them, right? So yeah, to suggest easy way, you know, compared to market, read more international book. Number two is, you know, to find the people in the shadow, find the information in the shadow. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Quick second question for Morris. Um, you mentioned you're a lawyer before, right? That's before right. you started the business. So what makes you, <laughs> um, you know, a quick lawyer? Yeah. You know, who makes sure money? Yeah. Have you ever been a lawyer? Uh, no. no. Um, <laughs> uh, in reality, I, I mean, one, being a lawyer is actually, I, I really enjoy being a lawyer. So uh, I know a lot of lawyers who hate their jobs. For me, it was really fun because you got to learn about businesses in a very short period of time where you have, you know, a month. I, I remember we, we represented like a payday loan, uh, you know, one of those payday loan lenders, um, and everyone thought that they were a shop, like, you know, shady company, but they were the nicest people in the world. Um, but like, learned everything about payday lending in, you know, a month. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but in reality, my family is, um, you know, there's just a bunch of entrepreneurs. My dad is an entrepreneur, my mom is, my brother is, and, and so like, the day I got to being a lawyer, I, I called my dad from my office and I was like, this is my office phone. I'm now officially a lawyer. You know, we spent a fortune on law. Or I spent a fortune on law school, but here it is. And he's like, "That's great, um, but you should quit your job today because, like, you know, this is a waste. You're working for somebody else." <coughs> and so um, that that phone call did not go the way I wanted it to go. Yeah. Uh, but like, I, I guess I got a lot of like family pressure, and for me, I was like, "Okay, this is a family thing." Yeah, uh, I, I wanted to ask Mishini um, a question. So, in corporate development, and I've been working as a business development manager for a startup, and like one of the things I do is like, yeah, basically develop strategic partnerships. And I was just wondering, do you have like what's some of your advice for navigating from a startup to like connecting and developing relationships with bigger companies and just Developing relationships, maybe for you know acquisition down the road, or just in general, just to build those relationships. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so I would say uh, I'm going to tease on a couple things that Wei said. One is like meet people to meet people, just because you want to get to know them. Um, Silicon Valley is actually like it does become a small world, right? So you meet people. Like just we were talking about how we are all connected, and it's literally all three months to people. Um, and so, uh, I think it's important to have those discussions and meet, but like, you know, do, do it the reverse way, right? Like, just want to meet, meet you, understand how you guys think about it, talk to you a little bit more. It can be informal; it doesn't always have to be in that context. Um, use your network. So, as corp dev, like. You know, people ping and say, like, let's meet and have coffee. That's great. It's great to, like, introduce yourself to a corporate dev team in a large company um, at least once. Mm -hmm. But I think, like, use that then wisely afterwards. If you're sort of, like, pinging every couple of months and saying, hi, I'm here again. It's like, what is there to talk about? You know, there's nothing to talk about. Like, they're going to be less likely to, you know, want to jump at the phone the next time you call. Um, and again, like, be honest, share the right things with them. Like, Hey, we are fundraising. You know, are you interested or not? Yes or no, and, and that's okay. And and I think people will appreciate that you're always sort of like keeping. Um, 
we always have, you know, this weird thing where like we get calls about like name a company, like plastic wrapping for sandwiches. Uh, that company has come across the desk before. Right? Like, everybody calls Google. Um, and if you can sort of like in the back of your mind, sometimes if you're bankers or whatever, you can just see them being like, oh, got to check the box, call Google. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's like not helpful. Uh, so um, not that we wouldn't buy a company because there's a relationship, right? I think, again, if the product is good, if the team is good, like it'll just sell itself. The relationships sort of matter less. People will find a way to connect you. Um, but do it, you know, do it through like the, the reasons of like, I want to actually eat something. What, how they think about it, or if they have advice for me, and I have some companies I want to show by them because I think it might be interesting to them. Once you start developing those kind of relationships, it's like a very easy way to have those conversations. I'm just going to add on to that corporate piece a little bit. I was actually just on a panel earlier today with um, folks who sit on the boards of some of the largest public companies, um, including Staples, Best Buy, uh, Bank of the West. Um, and one of the things that they said about the best ways to engage a corporate to have a conversation early, uh, which I found interesting, was that they were like, the best way to engage them is to embarrass them by having better business. So if you're trying to build something in a space that you think they might be interested in, then do that business fundamentally better than them. And that's how you can get their attention. So the best intros usually come from shared clients. So if you successfully sold to a customer that they also have and they're losing that customer, they definitely want to know who you are. And then we'll move back to the side. How did you um, manage to find that scalable business that you were talking about in order to get that customer acquisition with your two dollars? Um, yeah, it's exactly what Ray said about uh, when you're investing in companies. Once you start losing your money, you quickly find ways to stop doing that. So, like, um, I remember the first week we lost like five, uh, like, it was my money at the time, I lost $5,000 on Google AdWords. <laughs> uh, and I was like, okay, I'm going to stop this uh, because this is terrible. Um, and the same thing happened. Yeah, I, it was my fault. Uh, the same thing happened with like Pinterest when we started advertising on Pinterest. Um, we, like, you know, their ad platform is so bad. Uh, and, um, you know, they'd be like, we recommend you pay $3 per click. And so I was like, okay, let me try that. And like, you know, one day I lost like five hundred dollars, and I was like, I'm gonna stop doing this. Um, so the, the best thing I can tell you is like, um, go find uh, like once you start spending money and it's your own money, even if it's at small scale, you will be like, I'm gonna fix this problem. Like one of the look one of the biggest mistakes I think that like you know uh, e-commerce entrepreneurs make is they get divorced from acquiring new customers so early on. They're like, we raised a lot of money, we hired this agency, it's now their job to grow our business and to grow our revenue. I, I have no idea how people think like that because like you're the CEO of this business that's doing you know zero dollars in revenue on day one and your first job is to outsource zero to one dollar in revenue. Um, so for me, I was spending my own money, I was looking at the computer all the time being like, okay, is revenue going up? What's driving this revenue? Um, where are at working, where are they not working? Um, and so, so that's really like what it was. It was just losing a bunch of money. But I mean, it was really dirt, like you know, some of it was dirty. I'd go on Twitter, and if you tweeted about like Tom's main deodorant, I'd be like, yeah, Tom's main deodorant sucks. Go buy out. <laughs> <laughs> and now we've got a bunch of letters from Tom's main saying, go to that. <laughs> uh, so really, it's just lose money um, and we'll figure it out. Um, but in reality, there's a lot of advertising platforms uh, today, right? So like today. Um, if we were advertising for deodorant, I'd say an easy way to do it would be to try to like understand Google AdWords and then spend money there, um, and then look for people who are looking for natural deodorant um, and advertise to those people. Um, look, it, it, it tops out though because there aren't that many people looking for deodorant and searching for it on Google. I know I've never done it, um, and so for us, we had to uh, create demand. And the way I thought about it was like the movie Inception. Like you don't know you want this, but I have to create this idea in your head that you want our deodorant. Um, and in order to create demand, you have to find platforms that aren't search-based, and that's generally Facebook, Instagram, and like half of Pinterest. Um, and, and so that's where we spent our time. I know we had two questions on this side. Yeah. Uh, yeah so, uh, so you, Sean, you mentioned the, the value ads. So I just have a question uh, regarding the uh, value ads for both the investors and the, and the founders. So from the founders' perspective. Given that the, the capital is a commodity, for instance, you are facing very similar cap table term sheets from different uh, investors. Uh, whose money you will take home? 
like maybe there's some value as for that if you are looking for, for instance, uh, how much money, how much time this VC will spend with you, or the, uh, what kind of uh, expertise uh, in this vertical you, you are looking for on, the, on this VC uh, company. And then for the investors, for that if, uh, given that maybe this startup is a very trendy, very hot startup, you want to invest your money. And how you uh, differentiate yourself compared to the other companies. Uh, I'm happy to start about like what we look for, um, or I can look away, whichever. Uh, I'll start actually. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, you know, first a uh, thing I'll, we'll look at is like sort of size of fund. Um, and people like you know, it, it, we're, look um, if you're selling deodorant, deodorant is a three billion dollar a year category. It's impossible to have a billion dollar a year business there in just deodorant. So it, it, like if like uh, if a fund has a billion dollars in assets under management, they're looking to return investments of a billion dollars in, in big in big exits. That's what's interesting to them. Um, and, and so that's probably too big of a fund for us. Um, so one, I want to make sure that the size of the fund is aligned to the company that I'm building. Um, so if I'm building Airbnb, yeah, I go to Andrews and Horowitz or you know, Kleiner Perkins or some big guy out there. If I'm building a direct-to-consumer business, I mean, Andreessen Horowitz invests in some of them, and that's not a good idea for Andreessen Horowitz because they're not going to return Andreessen Horowitz's fund. Um, so one is size of fund, but more importantly than that is the, my personal relationship with the person that I'm talking to across the table. Um, there are a lot of assholes in the VC business. Uh, it, the vast majority of people are uh, assholes, um, and, and like you know, it's very obvious too because they're like, yeah. oh, like, like you know what Way did is he said, hey, here are the investments that I didn't make. Do you know how many VCs have done that? Zero. Uh, like they never talk about that. They'll be like, I invested in Ring. I invested in Airbnb. Uh, they'll, they'll even talk about companies that they invested in, no matter how big they are. They'll be like, yeah, I invested in Facebook. It was after Facebook went public, uh, so everybody <laughs> invested in Facebook. Um, but th that's the types of things they'll, see, they'll say, um, and they're outrageous, and like, um, you know, you listen to them and you're like, this is a bad date that I want to end. Um, please pick up the tab. Um, and so, like, in reality, it's entirely the personal relationship I had with the people, like, um, especially the, like, you know, after way one of our other investors was Azure, you know, they took six months to invest in the business. I actually really like that because they're like, we're gonna get to know you, um, and we're gonna get to know this business before we pull the trigger. Um, and so by the time we were sitting down and talking about deal terms, like I'd already met the guy, I already met Paul 12 times. Uh, we'd had lunch a couple times, we'd have gone out to drinks once or twice, I'd met everybody on his team. Um, and, and like, you know, uh, so, like some uh, some investors are going to be like, hey, um, I'm raising a new fund. I need you to fundraise and get a higher valuation so I can look good when I'm raising a new fund. And that happens all the time. Uh, Paul was never going to do that to me. Uh, and like he, you know, we had another investor who was like, I I'd appreciate you giving giving me monthly updates about the business. For the first year of the business, it was just me, and I was like, you think I'm going to spend six hours of my time creating a monthly update based on this last month? I'm going to go run this business. You invested twenty five thousand dollars. If you want your money back, you can have it tomorrow. Um, and then he's like, okay, I'll forget it, I won't say anything anymore. Um, and, and so like, uh, for me it was like, let me run this business and when I need you, I'm gonna call you. Um, and you pick up the call as if I'm calling the bat phone. You know? There's a bat phone in your house. When your wife is giving birth, you pick up my phone call. Um, and, and so like, I, I had a bunch, like all of our investors were phenomenal. Nobody pressured us into doing things that we didn't want to do. Every time I had a problem with the business, I would call them and they were there for me. Um, and it's because we have these personal relationships. And even now, I still hang out. Like, I went to Wei's, you know, holiday party a couple months ago. We still hang out because I have personal relationships with them. That was the most important thing for me. Uh, I think Moise answered most, most of my, my, my answer. Um, but from the domestic perspective, uh, there's so many amazing VCs in Silicon Valley, right? There's Sequoia, KPCB, a lot of amazing VCs. Of world class pieces, but there's a couple of things they don't have. But, uh, I think I have. It's uh, number one, like a more international than them. So, uh, and uh, they're, they're, they're very good at you know, Silicon Valley or American markets, but not good outside the US. Uh, so, I think I can offer a lot with the global vision. Just, that's how I started. And number two, this is a pretty big picture, right? Uh, you can go from very small picture, as Moise mentioned, right? Uh, entrepreneur, like be, being an entrepreneur or start your own company is tough. It's not easy, right? 
So I think all the entrepreneurs need the friends, not not the investor. So uh, so my my way back in back in uh, five six years ago was just be friends of all my portfolio companies. I never ask how their business do. I ask them to go out, out with me. I, I tell them some jokes and then they were like a bit messed up. I think uh, one thing is because all these people I invest, I invest in is I really <coughs> truly respect them a lot. I can learn a lot of things from these entre entrepreneurs. And then if you have this real respect, and then people will respect you. They, do they really just like want to figure out and want to be a good partner to you? And so some do what they do because they have to return cash to like very large investors. Um, and so just make sure like you're getting in, you're getting married with these people, right? even if it's a short amount of time. Uh, and so just make sure that the right people because um, money, money changes people. I guess for the same reason, don't necessarily fundraise unless you have to, because exactly like you said, once you take investors, that relationship doesn't change. I, I know we have one more question, and then we'll come back to this side. Yes. Thanks a lot of great info today. I'm going to jump on the way about the timing. Um, I had an app idea for about eight years, but finally I'm starting to see some more out there already. So I finally decided to incorporate it. Right? I find that it's very hard to find like, um, developers, because I'm not a technology guy. So is there any advice yet you have to give? Because investor won't invest unless I have some kind of prototype to show for them. But then... Finding a partner? Finding a co-founder? Yes. Uh, I think the easiest way is just to uh, go out networking. Right? Uh, you know, so go to parties, you know, join these kind of you know, conferences or clubs. And then there's LinkedIn, right? You can find red people go LinkedIn. When I was in China, it's, it's just a lot of random parties. Right? You spend like millions of hours to talk to people you never like, you never work with. It's, it's, it's better in the US, and there's LinkedIn, you can filter people, you, know, you can co-email people. Do write good co-email. Write some good co-email and you know, ask red people to because yeah. some that I talk to, they like the ideas and they're like, oh, you tell me what's this idea you have, right? And so you give them the whole secret sauce and I oh, okay. Then months later, you don't hear from them. And, you know, so it's tough in this area. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough to start a company. Yes. It's always tough. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, you have to solve the problem every day, right? You have to get used to this kind of thing. So. I mean, if you email people 10 times, it's not going to come out, email him 20 times. Right? So you have to conquer all, all this smaller thing every day. And actually, I was going to add a small point. I mean, uh, based on what um, Ash was saying earlier, she didn't know how to code before. She learned it herself because, you know, she felt like that was something that was an important part of her career. And so if that is literally the only obstacle that's stopping you, well, well, two things. One, you could learn to do it yourself. Or two, there's plenty of tools that you can now use, right? You don't actually have to code everything from scratch anymore. It used to be that you need to know HTML. You need to know how to design a great looking website or a great looking app. Now there's plenty of solutions you can just drag and drop. So there's actually things that you can conquer. But if you're trying to build a fundamentally technology-driven business and you don't have a tech background, then that's probably where you need to sit down and reflect and reconsider. Um, so I would say from an investor's perspective, it's important to think about whether or not the team that's building that idea is the right team to build that idea. Because most likely, I mean, there's really no new ideas under the sun. Every single idea people have probably heard of, even if it's something that founders think it's you know, the secret sauce, investors might have already heard it a couple times before. So the decision, I think, really when investors are looking at it is really, well, is this team going to be the team that takes this idea to the largest that it can be? Yeah. Um, I can add off the pop a question for Shini and Sho. Yeah. Um, you guys both come from sell side, and you're now on the buy side. Like, I actually did a few summers at investment banks, um, and I was just wondering, like, what 
uh, what made you like choose a shift? I know it's like a typical shift to make, but like, what are the differences you see in terms of like actual productivity you guys output for not only like the funds that you manage, but also like the co-founders that you're working with? So can you just speak a little bit on like the differences between self and self? Yeah, and I think like for me, the banking was sort of just an end means to an end, right? Like it was a skill that I needed to learn and I knew that was like one of the best ways to do it. Um, the biggest difference is uh, you're like in banking you're very transactional. You sort of like execute it, you move on, you have no idea what happened after the fact, right? You might if you're hanging out with the team and developing relationships, but really like you don't know if it was the right transaction, the wrong one, it's like not and it frankly you don't care. I mean, um, on the buy side, uh, everything we do has lasting impacts, right? Like we always have the saying that um, the work actually starts the day we close a transaction. So when we acquire a team, um, or even when we're investing, right? Like you're building this long-term relationship, and you actually like that's what the heavy work starts is trying to figure out how to integrate a product or how to you know roll out a new one, or whatever that is. There's a lot of uh, work involved, and so you have to be strategic about how you're thinking about it. And so you're looking at it from lots of different lenses. It's not a one-time transaction. It's saying like, oh, we're gonna acquire this founder to come in. Is this the right team? Like, are they googly? Which is a <laughs> verb that we use. But um, it's true because it's like, are they gonna fit into the culture? Or are they gonna stick out and wanna leave it again? And they're gonna be miserable because they hate you. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's that's like the biggest thing. And I, I actually think that part is the most fun, which is what is the strategy for you know, immersive computing? What is the strategy for maps and geo? Like what are they thinking about and can I find a company or think about how to structure a deal so that we make sure we make our So I definitely resonate with what you said. Um, I covered a little bit of this in the previous lecture we did here, um, but I would think of it this way. Um, if you're trying to figure out what to do as an next step trial and error is literally the only way. Because as much as you can talk to people and try to understand what it's like from their perspective, if you are remotely interested in something, unless you've actually tried it yourself, there's just never a way to know for certain. And so as you can tell by everyone sitting on the stage, we've all done different things in our lives before we kind of figured out where we want to be. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be in this for the rest of our lives. It could naturally evolve and turn into something else. And so um, I think the consistent um, kind of characteristic across, across all of us is that we're all entrepreneurial in some sort of way, even if we're on the investing side or we're on the corporate development side, there is that spirit of I want to figure out what skills I need to build, what company or what problem I'm trying to solve, and I'm going to gain the skills to do that. So I think if you already tried that for two summers and you know that that's not something you like, that's a really good thing that at least you've given it a try, you've done it, you know you have an answer now. So I think actually, uh, especially referring to um, Ash's story earlier about going to Antarctica during school, I mean school is the best time to just do all sorts of things that you might not do again, but it's just a great time to explore. Um, Earlier, I know uh, Moise and Wei were both talking about mistakes. This is not necessarily a mistake, but one of the things that I probably regret the most is not traveling more in school. So I know that I really like traveling, uh, but I think I took school a little bit too seriously. I probably shouldn't have as much, honestly. I mean, how important are your grades now, right, in the context of life experiences as a whole? So if there's things that you want to do and things that you want to try, definitely prioritize that and give that a shot. Yeah. Or actually, yeah, go ahead. I thought you had to ask a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, please. Yeah, I had a question for Wei, and also, like, we were talking about um, at the beginning, like, bootstrapping the company and approaching an initial round of funding with your pre seed. Um, and also, like, with a company that doesn't necessarily need a lot of money to start, what kind of revenue or, I mean, yeah, we're talking about, like, just having respect with. You know, initial founders, but what kind of revenue or user base is kind of like a good starting point for a company that's bootstrapping and going on their own? Depends on what kind of company it's D2C or Biotech or SaaS company mm -hmm. or you know, social app, what kind of company? It really depends, right? Okay, um, yeah, like oh, yeah, B2C, uh, I guess. B2C, too general. 
but, uh, but I'll answer the question later. So, um, I mean, for D2C, like, uh, like, I think, I mean, uh, couple educate half a million dollars. I mean, for D2C, I don't think people actually raise money in those days. <laughs> I mean, it's true because if you're direct to consumer, it better be something that consumers like. And if they like it, then they're paying you for the product. Yeah. In which case, then like, you have revenue and you probably don't need to raise yeah. as much. Well, most That's likely they did. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish that were the case. Yeah, but in reality, uh, look, I, I, I think he's right. It depends on the category that you have. If you're a D to C, you're going to raise you're going to raise this seed round or pre seed round, whatever you're going to call it, at 100 k revenue a month. If you're a SaaS company, you pro probably want, like, what is it? It's 100K ARR and you raise like, that pre seed round. Um, and a million dollars, I think, if you would like to raise a full seed round or something like that. Back. So it really depends on the category. And the reason for that is, look, direct to consumer customers, even customer media, uh, you're going to churn at some point, right? And that churn is massive because you use native deodorant, then you use Old Spice deodorant, then you use Axe deodorant, and then, like, we've lost you. While, you know, when was the last time you churned from your cell phone service provider or from Netflix? Like the churn on those on those systems is much less, mm -hmm. and so um, every dollar for those customers and every customer is worth much more, and so a, a lower amount of revenue will give you a higher valuation. Um, so it really depends on the category that you're getting into, um, and, and look, even the the guys that you fund rates from will be different. Like there are funds that are like Forerunner Ventures. If you're a yeah. you know SaaS company, you don't ever get a Forerunner. If you're a D to C company, you can get. Actually, speaking of that, that's probably a good opportunity to spend some time learning about all the different industries that are out there to get a sense of, is the industry you're in the right fit? So if you're on the BD side, it's actually probably worth type taking the time to just kind of explore all the different um, categories of startups that are out there. It doesn't have to be consumer. Maybe you give enterprise a shot and it turns out that you really like that business model, or it turns out that you go into hardware. And so take that opportunity to explore. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I know we have one last question, and then I'm sure everyone's willing to stick around for a little bit. I know it's getting late, so I won't keep you too late, um, but you guys are very welcome to come up and just say hi. Um, and actually, before the last question, the last thing I was going to mention is that obviously the fact that you're here today already is taking a huge step forward um, in terms of being more proactive asking questions, getting to know um, the industry better. Um, but the topic that I always recommend is uh, whether you're a student or a professional, being as proactive as possible. I mean, Wade talked about writing cold emails, Ash talked about you know, asking questions. But the, mo like, the more steps that you can take to get yourself in front of people to learn as much as possible, the better. Uh, especially for Berkeley students. I actually don't see Berkeley students very much at Palo based or SF based events, right? But if you do go, um, I mention this all the time, like if you do go as a Berkeley student, you really stand out. Because when you introduce yourself and you say that you're from Berkeley, they're like, wow, you came all the way. And that helps you stand out, right? It's a natural advantage. So we'll take that last question. Yes. So this is for home. So you come from a lot of fun. How did you stumble upon this type of genre? Do you have any just in the lab sometimes playing with chemicals? <laughs> <laughs> How did you come and figure out, okay, I think I have something here that I can take over from all spots. Sure. Yeah. Pretty sure the Department of Health Security has been playing with chemicals in the um, In reality, for me, it was like, uh, like if you if you ever buy one of those other deodorants or deodorants, like, I, I remember when I was in New York, I was standing in line and twitching I'd flip around Axe deodorant, which is what I was using. But they had these commercials on when I was 16 that if you buy Axe deodorant, women flock to you. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> but in any case, I, I'd like read the, the deodorant label, and I could not even pronounce a single word on the back. Uh, and I was like, you know, um, I was in my 20s at the time, and I was like, this is the only product I use on my body every day. Uh, and it stays on my body for 23 hours and 45 minutes a day. So I'm there when I sleep. The only time I wipe it off is when I shower, and as soon as I get out of the shower, I put it back on. So if I don't understand a single ingredient on the back of this thing, this cannot be good for me. Like, I should at least be able to pronounce one of the words. Um, and so that was sort of the genesis of the idea. Um, I mean, the timing was fortuitous, uh, like, you know, 
uh, certainly like, like Whole Foods open the door for um, you should start caring about what you put inside your body. Um, and then like the, na the natural evolution of that was you should start caring what you put on your body. Um, in terms of actually creating a product, we started working with this mom and pop manufacturer in Southern California. Um, they're like, um, they could produce a maximum of 500 units. This was the first like, couple months of the business. Uh, they were like, um, you know, th th they were selling like 10 deodorants a week at farmer's markets. And then they were making a deodorant for us. And we're like, look, um, we're going to need more deodorants. And they're like, this is fantastic. We were selling about 500 units a week. And they're like, this is fantastic. More deodorants than we ever could have imagined. Uh, and we can't wait to grow the deodorant. As you grow your business, we're going to scale our manufacturing. It's like, that's fantastic. Two days later, they call me and they're like, yeah, my son is sick, so we're going to stop scaling. <laughs> we're, we're tired. And I was like, well, that was quick. Um, and so I was like, I, I, look, that, there were a couple of moments where I thought our whole business was going to shut down, and that was one of them. And then I literally started Googling um, and, and calling every other contract manufacturer I could find and be like, hey, what is the minimum amount of deodorants I could buy from you in order for you to produce my formula? And like some people were like 25,000, and I was like, well, I can't afford that, so that's not going to work. Um, and this company in Texas was like 80. Uh, and we're like, well, we're, we're doing more than 80, so this will work for us. Um, and so we shifted our production over there. Uh, and there was literally two girls like around a dining room table making their deodorants for a while. And then we went from, like, they scaled, I kid you not, but they scaled with us from 500 units a week to, um, they started making about 25,000 a day. Um, and it was the same manufacturer. It went from an 800 square foot facility to a 10,000 square foot facility to a 30,000 square foot facility. They're about to move into a 60,000 square foot facility. Um, and like the woman there was just an entrepreneur. And was like, I found um, you know a horse that will get me to the finish line, and so I'm gonna ride this horse. And she grew her business, we grew ours, and it's fantastic. And like it was mutually beneficial for both of us. Um, and, and so for us, it was a lot of luck and a lot of like right on it. Um, but it was also a lot of like you know, um, tenacity. We just called up people and they're like, what's the MOQ you have? How fast can we do this? Until somebody was like, somebody was an entrepreneur on the other side and said, yeah, I can do this. There was one company we called in Chicago. The guy spoke for 45 minutes and did not let me tell him a single word about my business. And I was like, I'm never going to be able to do business with you. I can't even get on, I, I can't stand being on this phone call. Um, so, so it's just finding the right, the right person to do business with. And they say lawyers talk a lot. <laughs> So with that, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.